Hey guys, uh, Nate here for another lecture of uh, foundations, data science foundations, where we talk about really just the foundational problems of data science, uh, hopefully in a very novel way, um, in a way that less mathy people and less stats-mindedly people can understand. So I've, I've really made this so it's incredibly approachable for computer scientists, and I think it's even in my honest opinion, it's like it feels a little bit more robust in certain ways than the old ways that people teach data science. Okay, so today is a very special lesson for me because I get to I get to play kind of like a little game with you. Um, so I'm kind of alluding, and, and you might sort of figure this out. I, I think at, after this lesson, you can you can rederive really anything you want. Uh, the the rest of the rest of the class. I think with the exception of one thing, which, which I will uh, be pretty explicit about at that point, uh, can be sort of re-derived from this one principle that we learned in this, time, in, in this class. And I'm not even going to say the principle's name. Well, I'll say it now. And this, we're, I'm going to allude to the plug-in principle, uh, which, which is going to be the, the primary principle that we use um, in order to prove all of our interesting things about data science. But I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to use it, hopefully, for the, for the rest of the class. So. So for those of you that watch on and sort of see me talking about the plug-in principle and the things that we can do with it, right? And the things that we are able to do with it is, is it's a lot. So we're able to make estimates from the sample to the population. We're gonna be able to make confidence estimates on, on how robust those estimates are. We're gonna be able to prove that we can learn. We're gonna be able to derive the fundamental trade-offs being the bias variance trade-off and the approximation generalization trade-off. And then we're gonna be able to derive cures for the trade-off all, all based on this one thing which is the plug-in principle. Okay, so let's get started. You know, t today, I, I just wanted to show you, um, aside, besides, and, and this is kind of like in addition to random variables being so useful for our assumptions, and, and it's literally for the reasons that I'm gonna present in this class, um, they're also useful for another reason. So one, uh, so what is that reason? Um, well, that reason is that they're able to simulate randomness. So why the odd name? So the class's title is, is you know, Data Science Foundations. One, simulating randomness. Uh, so why? Um, so random variables are able to simulate things in real life, but not exactly. And I, I wanted to go ahead and put the caveats to you uh, up front. So one, a real life isn't always about numbers. So sometimes you're interested in different events. You're interested in, you know, how happy will my you know spouse be if I go ahead and I make a romantic dinner, and, or um, for example, um, what what color on my website will make people happy? Uh, and so like an A-B test on this. And so real life isn't always about numbers. So real life can sometimes be about qualitative things instead of quantitative things. And the second thing is that real life isn't always that exact. So for example, if you're flipping a coin, um, you know, the canonical answer is that there's a 50% chance of heads or tails. Well, in, in real life, you know, uh, it's, it's not exactly 50%, something like 51% heads and yada yada tails or, or some, something, a very small difference. And so there's these, like, you can't, you can't really ever say anything happens with just like a true 50% chance in real life. Um, so for those, those two reasons, random variables have a little bit of a hard time simulating real randomness, but hey, what can we do about it? Um, the, these two problems are gonna exist in any computer simulation. So let's make the best and move forward. Okay, so let's go ahead and show you how I can make a random variable that can simulate something in real life. Okay, let's talk about flipping a coin. Since that's the basic thing, is this is done in every stats and probability class, flipping a coin, generally people call this a Bernoulli random variable, but psh, we don't need that. Okay, so we flip a coin, it's either a heads or a tails. So it's something that's random, that's okay, we can represent random. Um, and it returns heads or tails. Problem, what can random variables return? They can only return numbers. Heads isn't a number. So what we need to do is we need to represent heads and tails as, as a number. Uh, so we need to pick a number for them. And what number do we choose? At this point, I'm, I'm gonna say it doesn't really matter too much. Um, so yeah, you could choose 0.4 and a billion, right? And that's a good number, or negative 42 and seven. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and for this example, I'm gonna go ahead and choose one and negative one. Later on, I will talk about a different representation. This is, this is probably gonna be in the practicals class. 
uh, where we talk about why choosing perhaps a zero and one is a, is a much better or a little bit more robust or a little bit more useful uh, system of, of choosing uh, Bernoulli random variables. Well, let's choose negative one and one. The choices or the choices are relevant for the moment. Um, and now we've represented a coin toss. So uh, random, if uh, the number is greater than 0.5, I go ahead and I return one. If the number is less than 0.5, I go ahead and return negative one. And I can sample this lots of times and count the number of ones and the number of negative ones. And I can figure out lots of things about it. Later, I will show you how. Okay, what else can we do? We can also do something like uh, rolling a die. And so in this case, I represent uh, the number of pips that I get back on the die being uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Um, so in this case, I just have a random number that returns 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 randomly. Okay, that was easy. What about something else? So for example, the, the classic one that people give, I think, after this is you're waiting for a bus. And the bus could arrive in a minute, right? It's expected to arrive in, I believe, one minute. But it doesn't have to. It could arrive in the next 30 seconds. It could arrive almost instantaneously after you look down at your watch. It could arrive in 10 minutes. If the bus route got shut down, it could arrive in an hour. Lightning storms or something like that. Perhaps the city canceled the bus route, and so it won't come back for another 30 years. So it could be any time from zero to infinity. Um, so that's kind of cool. So how do we represent this as a random variable? So what I've done here is sort of the canonical transformation. I've gone ahead and I've taken 0 and 1. So this is the, the easy random number generator that NumPy gives me. And I've made a negative log transformation. So log of 0 becomes negative infinity. And log of 1 becomes 0. So I've got something from 0 to negative infinity. All I need to do is slap a negative sign out in front. And then, ta-da, I have something that's pretty cool. So this is, uh, this is typically called an exponential random variable. And if you study probability, there's a lot of different random variables that are able to fit different real life situations. Um, and I printed out a lot of them below. So these, this is just a subset of them. And remember, random variables are only useful in so much as they actually simulate reality. If a random variable is an isolate, it doesn't represent anything about reality, then it's, it's pretty useless. Just as like if a data set it's gathered sort of on things that don't represent reality. So on toy houses instead of real houses, and you try to make this toy house thing work for real houses, you're going to have a problem. So there's always a connection between the data and reality that we need to sort of take care of. Okay, so we know how we make a, a random variable that simulates reality. We, we kind of you know, take guesstimates of what the probability should be, and we go ahead and we write out this full form of random variable. Um, that being said, now that we've made our random variable that simulates reality, how do we use it? I kind of don't even want to tell you this. It's kind of interesting. The, the real thing, so if we have, if we had a data set before and we wanted to, you know, summarize that data set in some way, what would we do? We would use summary statistics, right? These are super useful tools in order to summarize data sets. So wouldn't it be nice if we could have summary statistics on our random variable? That'd be awesome. We could find out what the mean, the median, the mode, uh, quartiles, standard deviation, variance, all of these cool things. A kurtosis, right, uh, that we talked about before, or, or we could do skewedness. We could talk about all of these cool things on a random variable. But how? So remember what I said before at least the connection that I made before between samples of a random variable and a data set. We can think of samples of a random variable kind of like the rows of a data set. And we can think of the number of numbers that a, the random variable returns as, as the columns. Okay, so we just need a data set. Then we can take summary statistics of that data set. How do we generate a data set? Maybe the simple tool is to take samples. So let's try it out. So for example, I go ahead and I take five samples from my exponential random variable, and I take their mean. I get 0.9, okay, nice. So maybe the, the mean of this random variable is 0.9. Maybe the mean time that I need to wait is 0.9 minutes. It's a little bit more complicated than that. And here's the problem. Um, what if the next sample that we get is really big or really small, right? It's a random variable. It could return lots of different things. 
So the solution to this is quite simple. What if we took infinite samples? Okay, so instead of taking just five, we go ahead and take infinite samples. Well, then we've got all the samples, basically. I mean, we've taken infinite samples, and we know all the values that our thing returns, and then we just average all those, and then ta-da. So infinite is a bit too many. Uh, what we can do instead, since we have really powerful computers, is we can take lots of samples. A generally, a good rule of thumb is something, so I said, I said over 9,000, of course, but an even better rule of thumb is over 10,000 if you don't want to remember that, but you know, hey, over 9,000 is pretty easy to remember. If we go ahead and take samples that are over 9,000, so in this case, I take 9,001 samples, I take their mean, I get a mean of 0.998. What's really cool about this, at least I think, uh, is that if you empirically do this, so, as we've done here, you get a number that's very close to the number that you would have gotten if you did this mathematically. So using statistics and the tools of statistics in order to do it. We can actually calculate lots of other things. So for example, we can calculate the standard deviation by sampling it uh, over 9,000 times. So standard deviation becomes one. Guess what it is in reality? It's one. And we can even plot its distribution. So we can plot its distribution here just by taking lots of samples from it. Okay, so this is kind of the power of random variables. Once you've designed your random variable, okay, you're able to do so many cool things with it. Uh, so why does this matter? Uh, so uh, we, uh, so what, how does this help at all? So uh, if you've been paying attention, the answer should be pretty obvious with you. Now, what you do with random variables is you take a real situation, you simulate it with a random variable, and then you take summary statistics of that simulation in order to answer fundamental questions. So for example, what's the, what's the 75th percentile of time that I'd be waiting at that bus stop? Or a really important question is you might make a random variable in terms of what's the number of sales I'll make next year. And you'll inform that by decisions that you've made in the past. Let's say you make around 500 calls each year. Let's say each call has a 10% chance of yielding a sale. And then there's a 1% chance of yielding a big sale, right? Uh, well, you can write that down, you can simulate it, and you can get an estimate for what the bottom quartile or the, or the top quartile of that distribution is, and then ta-da, you can go back to your boss and be like, hey, it's pretty likely they're going to be making between one and seven million dollars next year. Okay, so hopefully this has been very interesting and informative to you. As always, I've gone ahead and I've made a little uh, set of comprehension questions. For those of you that are new to this, uh, please go ahead and if you're interested, uh, write the answers to these comprehension questions down below. Um, I'll answer them. If someone has already answered them in a similar way, please just go ahead and upvote their answer. Uh, no need to answer again. And if this was interesting to you and you want to see actually how the, the sort of the plug-in principle sh um, gets used later on and how it relates to this lecture, please subscribe. Uh, the next video will be coming out soon. Thanks.